Okay, so everybody can hear me. Would you say yes? Maybe nobody can. Okay, good. So we're gonna continue. So today we will finish off uh, this part on the, some subfragment of uh, propositional logic and its satisfiability properties. Especially, we will finish this walk set algorithm and move on to resolution. So last time we talked about this walk set algorithm. It is a randomized algorithm, unlike the one that we saw before. And the algorithm itself is really simple. In some sense, it's less specified because some of the decisions is up to us. But in the generic, very weak form, the algorithm works like this. So it, given a CNF formula F, it randomly pick an assignment to the propositional variable appearing in F. If it happened to be the satisfying assignment of F, then we are lucky, then we are, this algorithm is finished and return that satisfying assignment. But otherwise, it tried to, because this F is a CNF formula, if I have an un, uh, assignment, if assignment doesn't really satisfy formula F, that means there is a clause which is not satisfied. So we pick that clause, which is not true, and pick one literal in that clause and flip the pro corresponding proper value of the corresponding propositional variable so that this lit the chosen literal is, is going to be true under the new assignment. So, and then it, that the entire, and the algorithm check whether the new assignment satisfy the formula F or not. If the formula F is satisfied, then we are done. Otherwise, it keep repeating the process. Okay, so actually the algorithm is described like this. You pick up an assignment randomly, and then if the formula is satisfied, we are done. Otherwise, we pick an unsatisfied clause and then pick a literal randomly. So uniform randomness appears in this second step. That's quite important in the analysis that we're gonna do soon. And we flip a coin there and flip the truth value of the of the of the propositional variable related to this literal, and that will make this literal to be true. But the formula may or may not be satisfied at this point. If so, if the formula is satisfied, we are done. Otherwise, we keep repeating the process. Okay, so it's a very simple algorithm, but it works surprisingly well in many cases. And one important property that we talked about is that if we, the formula F is a two CNF formula, so we look at the theorem. So we, we look at this theorem, which said if the formula is two CNF formula, if we pick this repetition parameter R to be large enough where this number is given by two times m times n square, and it's the number of propositional variable in, appearing in the formula. m is the precision parameter, which is related to how, I mean, how precise we want, or how correct we want this algorithm to be. And then if you pick this set r to the two times m times n square, then the algorithm returns the correct answer with probability one minus one over two to the power of m, okay? So, I mean, this, this kind of issue happens because it just, this kind of issue happens because if given formula F is true, I mean, F is onset, then this algorithm will always return onset. So it's not a problem at all. But if pro formula F is satisfiable, then the algorithm might return. There are two possibilities. The algorithm might return onset incorrectly or it might return set, okay? So this happens with a certain probability and we want to bind, bound, bound this probability. Yeah, so we want to set R large enough so that the probability of this unset answer is gonna be pretty small. In particular, the theorem said, if we set R to be two times M times N square, where N is the number of variable, propositional variable in appearing in F, and F is to CNF. So in that case, the probability of returning on set is going to be bounded by 
1 over 2 to the power of m. So that's going to be exponentially small with respect to this parameter m. So if you iterate more, well, uh, the in a sense, the precision of this algorithm will improve exponentially. Okay, so that's the, the what the theorem is saying. And right. So last time we look at the proof of this theorem, and then our proof is not like super formal, accurate proof in some sense because I'm using hand waving. I do hand waving quite a bit, but the, it at least the, the kind of things that I'm showing you give a big picture about what's really happening. The key concept that appears in the proof was to consider a variant of this, I mean, to consider the case where, just first say, so where the, we have a two CNF formula F and the formula F is satisfi satisfiable by an assignment A. So A satisfies the formula F, okay? We assume this situations, and then using, under this situation, we classified all the, all the other assignments by its distance to A. So we, we said there are some assignments which is exactly the same as A, there are some other assignments that is similar to, that is quite close to A in the sense that the truth value of only one propositional variable is different. So these are some assignment B1. So if A is like P gets value zero, Q gets value zero, then B can be something like P has a value one, but Q has a value zero. So they differ by only one, the value of one propositional variable. And then we also group all the assignment that is the, with distance two from A. So that can be maybe B2. And then B2. Uh, so it's a B1, B2 in this case, can be P is equal to one and Q is equal to one and so on. So then we classify all the others that are three times above, I mean, the distance is three from A, so on. So in our example that I showed you here, I mean, the distance is M most to two, but it can be quite as large as the number of propositional variable. And then what we introduced was we said, now imagine running this our algorithm, okay? Our algorithm that's shown here, so work set algorithm. Okay, so imagine the running this work set algorithm, but instead of this random initial assignment, let's say we're gonna run this algorithm from say PI. Okay, so starting from PI. And then we can ask how much time it's going to take up to its termination. Then that's a random entity because of the random choice that's happening in this, in this step. So how, how long it's gonna take? Well, depending on what's gonna be chosen is this random choice. But, the, and then even it may, may go on forever. So that's not one possibility, okay? But what we can do is that we can think about expected execution time of this algorithm under BI, but it happens that this algorithm always terminates, okay, with probability one. And then, so we can take the expected execution time if in, when we run this algorithm up from BI, and then we consider, so that we consider ex expected execution time of BI, let's call this as a TBI. But, and then we consider all the expected execution time, like a TB prime i, where this B i and B prime i are all have the same distance from A. So both of them are distance i from A. So distance of A, B i is equal to i. And also distance of A, B i. B prime i is equal to i and so on. 
So there will be several, I think, uh, quite a bit of this uh, assignment who are far from A with distance I, and we consider all of those and then take their maximum, okay? So and for all of those and think about this expected execution time in this case, uh, T V I, and this case, T V prime I and so on. And then we consider all of these expected execution time and take their worst case at maximum. That is defined by T I, so that's what, although I didn't write in this way, I mean, I mean that that's what we mean by this T I, okay? So TI means we, we revise the algorithm so that this algorithm is going to be run from some assignment, which is the distance I from A. And then we consider its expected execution time. And among all these instantiation with this BI, we consider the worst case expected execution time. So that is what's written by TI. And it happens that if we use ti, it satisfies this inequality. t0 is equal to 0. I mean, this means the, the current starting state is exactly a. a satisfies the formula f, so it terminates. And then also tn is, you can prove that tn is less than or equal to 1 plus tn minus 1. ti is less than or equal to 1 plus, I mean, the formula that you see in the screen. And so that's, so this is, I didn't give you the formal mathematical proof, but I gave you some idea about how you can go about proving these inequalities last time. Okay, once you have this, then all we have to do now to show that, uh, I mean, so what we're gonna do now is that we're gonna get some more information about TIs, okay? So to do so, we will, change ti by this what I call hi, hi. So it's not entirely obvious why this hi is always greater than equal to ti, but just take it my word, I mean, take my words, and that's happened to be the case. So if you replace all the inequality involving ti, so we can say, let's see. Yeah, so all the inequality that you see here, I replace them by, uh, here's another inequality, I replace them by equality, then it happens that this, we can, whenever we have a ti that satisfies this inequality, we can always find hi, which is larger than ti for every i, I from one up to n, no, zero up to n, and and hi actually satisfy this everything up to equal instead of inequality, okay? So let's just accept this. But once we accept this, uh, this fact, then what happens is we can now compute the exact value of hi. I mean, so this hi, now there are some unknown variables, then we have n plus one variable like h0, h1 up to hn. So we have, I mean, m, n plus one unknowns, which are h0, h1 up to hn. And then we have inequality for each of this hi. So we have the, well, actually equality for each of this hi. So we have equality for h0, we have equality for hn, we have an equality for hi, okay? For, for all the i's different from zero n, zero, zero and n, okay? So we have n plus one in, 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 uh, equations with n plus one unknowns. Then you can use what you learned from the linear algebra or maybe what you learned from the high school to solve this problem. I mean, to find an answer for each of this hi. So, so here's, I mean, you can do it exactly, but here's just some exercise I want you to do. So one exercise is to solve these inequations. And actually I gave you almost the answer. Prove that the, ends, the solution for this inequation is of this form. So I will give you maybe one minute to do some uh, checking here.
Yeah, okay. I mean, this checking is quite I mean, easy. You just need to substitute this quantity to all of these equations and see whether equations hold. And if you just plug in zero, in this side is a zero, this is a zero. So it satisfies the, the equation that you see here and so on. So you can easily check the other two. And so what that means is for the upper bound, we can have an exact number for the upper bound. In particular, for this h of n, which is, I mean, the upper bound of t of n, we can find an answer, which is n squared. So if you plug in n in these equations, i is equal to n. So we have a 2n squared minus n squared. So that is equal to n squared. So what does that mean? That means the mean, mean we, if you remember this ti, that was the worst case, I mean, that average execution time from some assignments, which is the distance i bar from a. Okay, so the, if we set i to n, that's the kind of uh, assignment which is the farthest from the satisfying assignment a that we assumed here, okay, that we assumed in this case. So the, the worst case, in a sense, average, this, this, the tn is going to be the worst case average execution time for all the assignment in this case. And the, the hn means that this worst case average execution time for any, uh, yeah, so for worst case average execution time from any assignment is going to be bounded by n square. Okay. That doesn't mean within n square we'll reach the right answer. Okay. That just means that with on average, the and sometimes we reach the the with the algorithm terminates fast because the random choices are just right. Sometimes it takes a longer time, but on average, the every worst case average execution time is gonna be bounded by n square. Okay. So now if you so if now we can use this fact to show the the theorems. So, uh, I mean, to you can prove. Uh, so let me let me give you. Okay, let me explain one tools that you need to use to prove these theorems. One tool that you can use is the so-called Markov inequality. I mean, the Markov inequality said if you have some non-negative random variable x. So this is one of the things that I showed you in the you know, first lecture. So as a background. So Markov inequality said if you have a non-negative random variable x, the probability that the non-negative random variable x is greater than or equal to a is going to be bounded by 1 over a times the expectations of x. So it's, what does that tells us is it, it says that we can bound the probability in terms of expectation. So expectation doesn't really say very, I mean, exactly what's going to happen with the probability, but this Markov inequality tells us some relationship between probability and expectation. Now, what you remember here, if you remember what we, we have here is that we said this TR, TN is a, is a worst case execution time. It's a maximum expected execution time. from any assignment to B, okay? So of the algorithm. So B can be anything because we, we, the B, I mean, Tn is larger than Tn minus one and so on. And, and then the, its definition of Tn covers the, I mean, the every assignment distance N far from the, 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 I mean, this assignment A. So this Tn is really, if you say that for any assignment B, if I run this set, the work set algorithm, the average worst case average execution time is going to be Tn, then we have a bound about this, which is n square. So using this fact, so this and then the this and the Markov inequality, their combination tells us the following. If you combine this with the Markov inequality, it says that if we Compute the probability of execution time 
from B is greater than or equal to A. And if we take this uh, maximum, right? So, so we take a maximum of B here. So we, we take the maximum probability of this one is greater than or equal to A. That's going to be bounded by one over A times mean T of N that with one of A times N square. So that's what we have here. And then using this mark of inequality and try to prove this theorem. So I will give you, uh, I think, three minutes to think about this. So your, your proof doesn't have to be fully formal mathematical proof, but if you connect what we dis discussed so far and argue the correctness, that, that I mean, come up with some reasonable argument for this theorem, that's gonna be good enough in this case. So, okay, let me show you the answer here. So the answer goes like this. I mean, it's written some way, but let me just explain what's really going on. So what happens is that if we set R to 2M times N square, then we divide the iterations into M phases, but each phase consists of the M uh, and two times n square step. So here's a two times n square step of the iteration. And another, we set r to the two times m times n square. So we have, we divide by two times n square and so on. So the last step is two n square step. And this entire number of phases that we are doing is m, okay? So the best way to understand what's happening in the proof or what's happening in, in the algorithm to prove this theorem 
is that you can view this algorithm as not exactly independent, but m triers of m trier trier of something pretty similar. Each trier we run this algorithm up to two n square step. Initialization may be different. Okay, so here we initialize with something. Here we initialize something with a different. That that initialization will be determined by what's really happening in the process. Again, the initialization will be different and so on. But each phase is a bit similar because the algorithm essentially repeats the same thing over and over again. Okay, now we, for, we are in a situation where f is 2CNF. And then there is a satisfying assignment A of f. And now what we want to argue is that if we want to find the probability that of the algorithm can't really find satisfying assignments in the in this phase. Also, it doesn't find satisfying assignment in this phase, this phase, and this phase, and so on. So, in a sense, algorithm is a bit like we we give algorithm a chance to find the satisfying assignment, but it fails m times of finding the satisfying assignment. So, what we're gonna compute is that we're gonna find the probability of this algorithm failing to find satisfying assignment in m times, okay? So, and that it happens that the algorithm failing to find the satisfying assignment in single phase is bounded by one over, uh, one over two. And the, because in other, I mean, if the algorithm couldn't find the satisfying in any of those phase, that means it failed in this in this case, and it failed in this case, it failed in this case, and so on. Then probability of failing to find satisfying assignment in all of these m phases is going to be bounded by one over m, in one over two to the power of m. Okay. So I mean, so what that means is if we can show so that because the theorem said the probability of failing is I mean, one over two to the power of m. So if we can argue that in each phase, probability of a failing is, is bounded by one over half, I mean, anywhere. So then that's gonna be good enough to argue the probability of failing in everywhere is gonna be bounded by one over two to the power of m, okay? So now the question becomes how we can show this, the probability of failing in a single phase is gonna be bounded by one over half. And that can be proven by this using Markov inequality and what we have shown there. So in that case, we can argue like this. So we said the probability of a failing from some state. Yeah. Probability of failing some state. Satisfying assignment from starting from some B, satisfying assignment B, no, no, not satisfying, some assignment B in. Ah, so they are not actually independent, but the we are, I mean, strictly speaking, we are using so, uh, so-called Markov property because we are, the kind of bound we are computing is not about the probability. We are really compute bound binding and bounding the maximum. We're gonna bound this maximum of this guy. So that's why the proof will go through. It's not, we are not using independence. We are using uh, this so-called Markov property, which said, just knowing the starting point is good enough. And then we're gonna bound the, the worst case of this, prob uh, this probability with respect to any B. So that's why we can use this multiplication. Okay. So, so the probability of not finding satisfying assignment starting from B in two to the n step. So, so that is the same as, uh, let me just use it here, okay. So, 
So then this probability is the same as now imagining running this algorithm, the starting from state P, and then we said the we measure the execution time. It's gonna with probability one, it will terminate, but we measure its execution time, and then that execution time is larger than two to the n. So execution time from the greater than two to the n uh, n square. Okay, so here's max is always going coming with us. But this one, we, we said that uh, that's gonna be bounded by, I mean, now we use a Markov inequality. So if you use Markov inequality, that is with max outside one over two to the n square times expected execution time from B. But this whole thing is gonna be bounded by one over I mean, two n square times n square. Because this expectation is always bounded by n square, so that is equal to one over two. So if you, we just show that in each phase, the probability of failing to find the satisfying assignment is one over half, regardless of the initial state, okay? And because we are computing this bound without really thinking about the initial state, for all initial state, we can multiply these probability together to bound the probability of failing everywhere. So that's how you can do the proof of this uh, this theorem. Uh, where's my mouse? Okay. Right. So in fact, I mean, if you are familiar with the random walk, then this is an instance of a random walk where we have a two kind of, I mean, it's a bouncing random walk from, I mean, this formula, the H, that you see there is a so-called bouncing random walk and with one observing point. Okay, so here's some summary of what we have discussed so far in this lecture. The first we said that three set is, is I mean, as bad as, uh, yeah. So we talk about some sub kind of fragments of propositional logic formulas, especially we looked at on set and the two set formula, two CNF formulas, but they have a uh, efficient the satisfiability checking algorithms, polynomial time algorithm. That's because for them, we can use the structure of those formulas to design an algorithm that doesn't have to do backtracking, okay? Satisfiability for a given formula is like a searching problem. You want to come up with an assignment that make formula true. Typically, if you do search, you need to do backtracking, but for some cases, because the formula is nice, we can search for the right answer without backtracking at all. And it happens that for home set and two CNF, that is the case and that's why we can come up with an efficient algorithms. And right, and then we also talk about walk set and then the, it's not, I mean, algorithm is easy, analysis is not easy at all, okay? And then even if you want to be super formal, then it becomes more and more challenging. Now that's typically the case with a randomized algorithm. But anyhow, what we've shown is that for work set, for two CNF, it behaves pretty well. But if you want to repeat a sim similar kind of analysis for three CNF, you will see that the polynomial guarantee that we have, which is num the, if we increase the number of iterations, the probability of having something bad decrease exponentially that kind of a guarantee no longer true for the three CNF formula. Okay, just to sum up, satisfiability is not very easy, but for some subfragments of propositional logic formula or some frag kind of formula which is written in a certain way, the satisfiability becomes a bit easier. Okay, it can have a polynomial time algorithm. But one thing I want you to remember is that and also remember is three satisfiability, three for C satisfiability of three CNF formula is as bad as the satisfiability for arbitrary CNF formula. Okay, so that's it for the this lecture. I mean, do you have any questions to to ask me at this stage? 
I know it's not very easy in this environment, but if you have any question. Okay, I will so I'll move on to the next topic. So next topic is, yes. Jung would you, yeah, continue. jung would you continue and ask a question? Yes. Ah, so if you so if you transform a, a variable, the some I mean if you take any formula and then somehow you can you express as a Horn formula. So then the you can apply so if so if you, your formula is a Horn formula, then we can apply the this algorithm for the Horn. I mean, this Horn clauses, no Horn Horn form, the Horn formula, the satisfiability solver for the Horn formula. But the because I mean the we are we believe the satisfiability for general propositional logic formula is not very easy. So very likely there does not have a polynomial time algorithm. That that means your translation is either doesn't preserve equisatisfiability, or if it preserves equisatisfiability, your translation from the usual given formula into Horn formula will blow up. So it will convert the conjunctive normal form formula into some Horn formula, which can be quite large. Okay. So you, you can't avoid the, it, it's, so if you can come up with some polynomial time translation from arbitrary CNF formula to Horn formula, I mean, that's gonna be a big breakthrough in the complexity theory, which means that I don't really, I don't want to be sarcastic. I just meant that it's not going to, it's very unlikely most of the, I mean, we can come up with some nice translation from the Horn, the usual propositional logic formula to Horn formula, which doesn't really blow up in the, in the complexity sense. Yeah, that's right. For two CNF, the same. Maybe there is a possible way to encode the to take the normal CNF into equi satisfiable two CNF formula, but it's because two CNF has a polynomial time algorithm. That means very likely the translation will have an exponential blow up. So it will take exponential time. Okay, so now we're gonna move on to resolution. So this is, uh, I mean, in some sense, the big resolution is the big kind of topic of the course. It's a basis of the modern math set solver, especially set solver with uh, clause learning, and also first order logic solver, automated theorem prover for first order logic. Many of them are based on the idea of resolution. So we're gonna study resolution for propositional logic now and later we will study the resolution and analyze its property by for the first order logic. So in, we just discussed that satisfiability is not very easy and the truth table based, met, based met, method can take exponential time, but, and also we look at some polynomial time algorithms, but they are quite limited. So they are only for some special kind of formula, like Horn formulas, 2CNF formula, or XCNF formula, I mean XORCNF formulas, and so on. So then you might ask, can we come up with some algorithm that maybe in the worst case it will perform badly, but in the in the usual case it performs reasonably well? For instance, if we have a, some reasonably good algorithm, if we give it happens that we give a two CNF formula to this algorithm. We want this algorithm somehow automatically. I mean, it doesn't really try to do anything special for two CNF, but it performed reasonably well. We've almost checked the satisfiability in polynomial time in most of the cases. So that's the kind of, so that what we want is that we want to come up with an algorithm that can exploit the structure of the given uh, propositional logic formula, okay? 
truth table is bad because it completely ignores the structure of the given propositional logic formula. It just do the enumeration without really looking at the, the, any interesting things that appears in the formula in the propositional logic formula at all. Okay, so it happened. The resolution is just one such method, and it takes exponential time in the worst case, but on the usual case, I mean, in the many good cases, it performs pretty well. Okay, so it's an algorithm that can exploit the structure of a given formula. And then it takes polynomial time if we give a horn or two CNF formulas to, them, to it. So that's a bit surprising. It's, the algorithm is not designed specifically for horn clause or for two CNF, but it takes polynomial time for such formulas. I mean, you, you can check the satisfiability of such formulas in polynomial time. And it can very easy to automate and, and because the, the, the resolution as a proof system is extremely simple. It only have a one proof rule. So it's very, also the mechanism itself is very simple. So it's very easy to automate. And also because it's so simple, it's very easy to analyze. Still, the algorithm, I mean, this resolution-based algorithm or resolution-based proof system is so-called sound and complete, which means if we prove something with the resolution, then we always prove correct I mean, we always get the right, correct answer. That's a bit weird for you if you haven't really heard about proof system, but sometimes the proof system has a bug so that if you prove something in the proof system, you might, even if you have a proof of something in the system, you might end up with some incorrect statement. So soundness means our proof system itself is correct. Completeness means that using our proof system, we can prove everything. Okay, we can prove all the true fact. Resolution has this, this property. It is a sound. So using resolution is innocent safe. You can only arrive at the right conclusion. And then it's powerful, so it's complete. You can, using resolution, you can prove everything. Okay, so that has a sound and complete property. So, I mean, actually, like I think my friend want to make some fun of this word resolution. So they, you might heard about the word resolutions, especially when you want to buy a, I mean, like a monitor or maybe the camera. So then the, often they said the resolution of this camera is like blah. And say if the number is high, the cam, that means camera is very good. So that's a one sense of resolution, which is, uh, and it's a, you can say it's a precision or the, the size of the smallest units. That's the meaning of one meaning of resolution. But another meaning of resolution is this one, which is when two parties are in conflict, so they are fighting with each other, resolution means they somehow negotiate well or discuss things well so that they, they reconcile, okay? So they come, maybe sometimes they come to an agreement, but they, they reconcile. So that's the second meaning of, I mean, okay, one, one of the other meanings of resolution. And then the resolution in the, the meaning of the resolution in the resolution prover actually is related to the seconds. So it's, it's a, a, the, the word resolution, we people use it for this type of specific proof system we're gonna discuss because it has this flavor of taking two parties we are, which are in conflict and bring them together and make them reconcile. So that has this kind of feeling is made but this kind of sense is going on in this proof system. Okay, so here's another high level discussion, but to understand the resolution, maybe having some understanding about what we mean by proof system is useful. So proof calculus is, is usually, I mean, it doesn't really worry too much. Of, when people talk about proof calculus, they usually don't worry too much about automations. Instead, they focus on some well-specified set of rules from each to that captures the way of doing correct reasoning. Okay, so the proof calculus when people talk about talk about it, it it usually refers to a collection of of rules that if you use these rules, then and derive some facts. So it's okay. So collection of rules. And the, the, what these rules does is it allows you to derive some conclusion from the hypothesis. So proof calculus refers to a collection of rules 
which allows you to derive some conclusion from the hypothesis. And these rules are very mechanical. It doesn't mean that the proof search in a proof system it can be done very efficiently or maybe even can, is, it, it has an algorithm. It doesn't mean this, but it means that the, each of the rules have a, it's a bit like a program, it's specified completely. And so if somebody say, okay, I produced a proof in a proof calculus, then it can be checked okay, by a machine. So that's a bit different from mathematical proof. In the mathematical proof, people see whether mathematical proof is correct or not, but coming up with a machine that check the mathematical proofs in a textbook is going to be a very hard problem. And that, on the other hand, in the proof calculus, because all the proofs are constructed according to a rules, checking whether some proof, claimed proof, is actually a proof in the calculus can be done automatically by a machine. So proof checker can be implemented. But resolution is, that is an instance of such a proof system, but it's just extremely simple. Okay, resolution has only one rule of inference. As I said, it is sound and complete. Soundness means whatever you prove that, that, that is correct. So in so anything proved is valid. So that's what soundness means. And the completeness means that all the correct things can be proved. Anything valid can be proved in the system. So I'm gonna relate, later I'm gonna relate soundness and completeness of a resolution in, in terms of validity of logical formula. But I guess the better way to understand this is resolution proof system is designed to prove unsatisfiability. Really, the, so there's some word which we're gonna talk about, which is called the resolution, I mean the reputation proof. So they, the resolution proof system is designed to prove unsatisfiability. So soundness in that case means if we can prove something is unsatisfiable in the resolution proof system, it is indeed unsatisfiable. Completeness means if uh, some propositional logic formula is unsatisfiable, they can, using resolution, we can prove its unsatisfiability. Okay. So unsatisfiability, unsatisfiable probability, no, unsatisfiability, pro probability of unsatisfiability in the resolution proof system is the same, same thing as the real meaning of unsatisfiability. So that's what this soundness and completeness tells us. Okay, so that to understand the resolution proof system, we first have to have, think about some different way of representing CNF formula, which is, is, is not, it's very simple, but it's very convenient, okay? So in this representation, we're gonna, CNF formula, so CNF formula in general, it has the form, it has literal one, one, literal one, two, and, on a, and then another clause, which is maybe literal, literal two, three, and so on. So you have uh, this, this type of syntactic representation and you can represent it syntactically. But another way to represent a uh, CNF formula, especially which, which is especially useful when we talk about this uh, resolution proof system is in terms of a set, okay? So we say, we're gonna represent each of this clause by a set. So this is a set of literals. And then another class by another set of literals, so it's like a two, one, two, 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 three. Okay, so each literal is represented by a set. And then for entire CNF formula, we're gonna represent it, represent it by a set of set, or a family of set. So the CNF formula will be represented by I mean, this kind of family of sets. Okay, so we said it's a set of clauses. So here's an example of this representations. So if you see the formula P1 or not P2 and so on, and that we can, we, we we're gonna represent this by, I mean, this is family of sets, but the first set is gonna be P1 and negation of P2 and so on. So that's gonna be coming from, that is coming from the, this first 
clause, and then the second set is coming from the second clause, and so on. And why we are doing this, and we are doing this because this is actually, yeah, so here's just some exercise I want you to do. So the first exercise is, I mean, represent the first one as this represent, I mean, express this first formula in this representation. Second, try to think about why, what, what, is, what is good about this representation. Give you I mean, one minute to think of do this. Yeah, okay, so just give the answer. The first one is really simple. If this, I mean, this first clause is going to be P1, negation of P2. Second clause will be exactly the same as the first one. So it will not appear when you write this formula as a family of sets. The third, third clause is going to be P3, negation of P4. The last one is negation of P2. The reason it's good is that you can see that some repetitions disappeared. So this is syntactic formula. Sometimes it can be very redundant. So especially it doesn't really know this disjunction is idempotent, which means P1 disjunction P1 is same as P1. So it doesn't really know that kind of information. But if we express it in terms of set, that information gets incorporated automatically. So it's a bit like, suppose you have a sequence of elements and you want to get rid of the same element in the sequence. Suppose you're writing program, your program take a sequence, and then that sequence has a rep repeated element, but you want to get rid of them, how you can do it. Some simple way is you just convert the sequence into a set and then convert the set into sequence again. Okay, so that's, in some language, it can be done by just invoking some library routines. And I mean, that's, that can that get rid of the repeated element. That's because the meaning of set, just say only one instance appears in the set, okay? So this, from the logical perspective, if we represent things in terms of a set, then the idea of, I mean, the, the idempotence rules is taken care of import, okay, automatically. Also, because the set doesn't really care about the order of elements, okay? So the commutativity of the all conjunction and disjunction are taken care of automatically. Also, it doesn't really say the, I mean, the first things has to be combined and, and then second one and so on. So it, does, it also take care of our so-called associativity. So, so the, I mean, just what I said, that the, if it I mean, represents the CNF formula as a family of sets, it give is simplified quite, I mean, not too much, but it simplifies enough that, make, that will make our life a bit easier. And from the logical perspective, what it does is that it computes kind of normal form or kind of canonical form, modular associativity, commutativity, and idempotence of the conjunction and disjunction. So the three formula that you see on the in the screen will all have the same representation in the, in in terms of uh, in this family of set representation. And just to give you a reminder, for empty clause, which is correspond to an empty set, is equivalent to false. And in the resolution proof system, we're gonna denote it by box. I mean, this box will appear quite a bit. So, so, uh, so it, I mean, this box will appear quite a lot. And then the, but the one consequence is that if we have a CNF formula represented as a family of sets, but the family contain box, which means if family contains an empty set, then that CNF formula is gonna be unsatisfiable, okay? So, and then 
Later, you will see resolution prover take this family of sets and produce another family of sets and so on until it will it succeed to add this box into the set. So that's how this algorithm works, or how the resolution proof system works. And then, so this box will play a quite important role. If the conjunctive normal form formula is an empty family, then that is equivalent to true. So that's the same convention that we did before. Okay. Now here's a reminder of another things that we talked about. We said for every literal, we talk about this complementary literal, which means we just we just put a negation on it and make sure that double negation doesn't appear. So if it's a P, we just put a negation. If it's already negated, we get rid of negation. So it's a complementation of a literal. And we're gonna denote this complementation of the literal by L bar. Okay. Now here's a really important concept in the resolution proof system, which is called resolvent. Okay. So we resolvent is defined with respect to the two clauses. So suppose we have a clause C1 and C2. Just to give a reminder, this clause is a disjunction of literals in our representation. This is C1 and C2 are going to be a set of literals. Okay. And then some clause R, which is another set of literals, we say it's a resolvent of C1 and C2. If we can, there exists a complementary literals L and L bar, L appears in C1 and L bar, so negation of L appears in C2. And furthermore, R is defined by taking the union of C1 and C2, but without L and L bar. Okay, so from C1, we get rid of L. So C1 contains L, we get rid of L. C2, we get rid of L bar, okay? So I, mean, I said the resolution is like two conflicting parties get together and reach an agreement or reconciliation. It's a bit like, I mean, something like this is happening. I mean, in the very bad analogy, C1 and C2 are fighting and this C1, doesn't like L, C2 doesn't like L bar. So their way of resolving them is just getting rid of this L from C1 and L bar from C2 and take their union. Okay, so that's what's happening in R. And then often we're gonna write the resolution proof. Sometimes we're gonna write the this uh, step, I mean, what this type of re resolvent by in this tree or well, inference rule style notations where the C1 and C2 appears above the bar. So then R, which is a conclude resolvent, is gonna appear below the bar. In fact, the resolution prover is, is nothing but just inference, inference rule which say from C1 and C2, if we can derive the resolvent. So this is a single rule that you see in the screen is the, the only rule in the resolution proof system. And in the resolution prover, we said, well, resolution proof system, we, we say that this R is resolvent, R is derived from C1 and C2. Just to recap, here's a notion of, the important notion here is a resolvent, and then the process of getting resolvent from two clauses, this process correspond to the, I mean, it is the only proof rule in the re resolution proof system. And whenever it is, used, so this rule is used, we express it in terms of this uh, rule, I mean, this bar tree-like notation, and then we say that R is derived from C1 and C2 by resolution. So here's an example of, of the resolvent, and then the instance of using this proof rule of the resolution proof system. So Suppose we have a uh, one clause P1, P2, and negation of P4, and another clause negation of P2 and P3. So then we, you can see that the literals P2 appears here, and its negated form appears in the other clause. So what we in this resolution proof system, we can compute a resolvent by getting rid of by canceling this P2 on from the both side. So that. If you cancel P2 in both sides, 
the P2 disappears, P2, negation of P2 disappears, it takes a union, it's going to be P1, P3, and negation of P4. So that's what we obtained here. And we can express it in terms of this derivation style notations, where above the bar we have a two clause from which we derive the resolvent. Resolvent appears below the bar. The empty clause can be a resolvent. I mean, so if we have a two clause P1 and negation of P1, we can de derive an empty clause, which is an empty set, which is also oft written in our case as a box. It's a resolvent of this because when they cancel each other, if you take a union, it's going to be an empty set. And that can be written, that will be written as often written as the derivation that you see here. Okay. So here's some exercise I want you to do. I want you to compute uh, resolvent in each of these three cases. Resolvent doesn't have to be unique. It can be, uh, there can be multiple resolvents, but you know, compute the resolvent in the case one, two, three. I'll give you two minutes to solve this problem. Yeah, okay, so let me look at the answer here. So the resolvent for the first case, if you look at the formula, then P4 appears here, and negation of P4 appears here. So the one resolvent is canceling this P4 and negation of P4. So the resolvent is gonna be P1, negation of P2, and negation of P5. In the second case, now there are, let's look at what's the, so there is a P1 and negation of P1, but also there is P4 and then negation of P4. So you might be tempted to say, oh, actually I like to cancel both. So then the, the resolvent has to be, uh, maybe, So you might say resolvent has to be the only remaining one, P2, and negation of P5. But this is wrong. I mean, this is, I mean, so it's incorrect. When you do the resolution resolvent, only one clause can be, can well, only one liter can be canceled, not the two liters. So the right answer in this case is I just canceling P1 only or just canceling P4 only. So if you cancel P1 only, we end up with negation of P2. I will tell you what I mean by wrong. Maybe it, it I mean the next Monday. P5. Or if you cancel P uh, negation of the P4, we'll end up with P1. P2, P1, and negation of P5. So both of them are correct resolvents of the one that we started with, but not the one that I show here. One, I mean, so just to give you some sense about what, what I'm, we're going to talk about this later in a so called resolution lemma. But one thing that, that's guaranteed by the resolution prover is that if 
we have a C1, R is a resolvent of C1 and C2, then C1 and C2 always implies R. Okay. So, but in this particular examples, you can see that the, I mean, this guy and this guy doesn't really imply the one on the right hand side where, where two literals are canceled. Okay. So this is a kind of simple, easy mistake that the students can make. And then for the third case, the resolvent is just canceling P1 for both sides. So it's going to be negation of P2 and P4. Okay. And now we're going to derive the notion of derivation or formal proof in a resolution proof system. So the formal proof or derivation in a, of a clause from a set of clauses F. So our starting point is we have a set of clause means that F is just converted to CNF formula. No, so Changkong, we don't have to take any precedence at all. So in the second case, we can pick either the one or the other. Then in actual algorithms that use a resolution prover, it has to I mean, which one to choose is something that has to be decided by an algorithm designer. So resolution proof system doesn't actually tell you all the details of the algorithm. It just give you some big skeleton. Okay. So for the derivations, we, we have a CNF formula. And then we have some clause C. And then the derivation or proof of the of this clause C from the this CNF formula F means a sequence of uh, clauses like C1, C2, up to CM. It's a, but it satisfies have to satisfy two properties. First, because it's a proof of C, this last guy should be equal to C. I mean, otherwise it's not going to be a proof of C. So it's, it has to satisfy C. And the second step say every proof step should be just justified by either assumption or from the resolution. This is a proof of the resolution. So you say that every CI, so something that appears like either C1, maybe C2, some CI that appears here, it can be an assumption, then we don't care because it's something that we assume. Or CI, if it's not an assumption, that has to be a resolvent of some C, J, and C, K that appears before the, this, this is CI. So if we have a, some CI appears here, if it's not in the given formula F, there has to exist some C, J, and C, K that appears before CI, such that we have a resolution, C, I is a resolvent of C, K, and C, C J. Uh, CJ. Okay. So this is what should happen. So that really means either every proof step in this proof is going to be either from the assumption or from the application of this resolution proof step. And we are in particularly interested in specific kind of a proof where the conclusions, so this C is corresponding to the conclusion, the conclusion C is going to be the box, which means the conclusion is going to be false. So why we care about this? I mean, you can, the good intuitions about this resolution proof system is essentially proof by contradiction. Okay. Now, I mean, one thing that you often do when you do the proof is just assume, I mean, put the negation of what you want to claim, and then you derive the contradictions. And then from there, you say, oh, yeah, we, we prove the property that we care about. So resolution proof system is, in a sense, mirrors what's really happening, this proof by contradiction. So often, what we care the most is the, I mean, is that the derivation where the final conclusion C is going to be a box, which is the contradiction. So here's an example proof. Uh, yeah, so here's an example resolution proof. So assume that we are, so it's a example resolution refutation of the, some CN, given CNF formula. 
So, okay, so the, well, another terminology is if the conclusion is box, conclusion is false, then we say that the proof uh, of, from some uh, CNF formula as we call that kind of proof as resolution refutation of the CNF formula. We, in a sense, refute it, the CNF formula doesn't make sense because it has some issue, okay? So, so here's uh, some example proof. So we have this uh, CNF formula, then the proof or derivation in the resolution proof system is a sequence of clauses. So we have a sequence of clauses. And then each clause, so then the second, because it's a refutation, the last guy has to be box. So that, that also is true. And then we, the, the other thing we have to make sure is that each of the step is either assumption or the application of this resolution proof step. So the first one, x and negation of y, that's an assumption. It's coming from here. So that's, that's okay. y negation of z, that's also coming from the assumption. So that's okay. But now this y and y, y or z, which can be obtained from these two, this, what we get in step one and step two by the resolution that get rid of this y. So, so this is also okay. And then the third one is assumption and so on. So this is really constructed according to, I mean, the, every step of this uh, derivation meets the second criteria, which is each uh, step should be either assumptions or coming from the application of the resolution to two clauses derived in previously. Okay. So then, Another typically people represent this as a proof tree because if you represent it as a proof tree, it becomes a lot easier to see the like wh where we use resolutions. I mean proof step on which clauses. So for instance, in this representations, everything that appears in the leaves, like these guys. I mean leaves were some of the outermost side. They are really coming from our given formula F. Okay, they are the assumptions made, and then the the conclusion. Each of the conclusions from this bar or this uh, proof step, they are really the is obtained by applying the resolution proof step. So this is is obtained from the resolution of these two guys by canceling y, and so on. So this proof tree give a some nice represent, I mean, can keep a good way of seeing where, we, what is used where, okay? On the other hand, proof tree is a very, I mean, it's not a compact representation. It can be very large. So it's good, but if for when you do the automations, people often don't really record proof tree directly. Okay, so that's it for today. We're gonna, on next Monday, we're gonna continue talk about We'll continue to discuss this resolution proof system. And next Wednesday, there will be no lecture because that's an election day. Okay, so that's it for today. And I'm gonna stay here for five minutes. You can ask me questions. Okay, so thank you all.